Uh, today, we're delighted to have Rhiannon Main uh, giving us a talk from Texas Christian University uh, because they have better internet than she does have at her house, she tells us. Um, she um, got her uh, bachelor's degree at Edinburgh University in geology and then was influenced by a friend of ours, Rhiannon Jones, who at the time was in New Mexico and then I guess was giving a talk in Edinburgh and then uh, inspired her to uh, continue her dream of working on space science, so she tells us. Uh, she got her PhD over at the University of Tennessee working with Hat McSween, sort of like Tasha Dunn, who gave our last lecture. Uh, and then she's been, she post back to the Smithsonian where I guess I met her when she was there. Um, and she wears uh, many hats, she says, at Texas Christian where she's been since 2009. Um, she's the curator of the Oscar Monig the fabled Oscar Monic meteorite collection there, and she's a faculty member in the Department of Environmental Sciences. Um, she's going to give us a talk today called Charmed, I'm sure. I wonder if it has anything to do with witches on TV, but we'll find out. Uh, meteorites as objects of cultural importance. So thank you very much, Rhiannon, for giving us uh, today's talk, and the floor is yours. Thank you. So because Zoom can seem a little impersonal, um, I decided to start today with kind of a slide that at least shows you a little bit about me and also lots of other reasons why I am giving the talk today in my office and not at home because my nine-year-old and that mini Labradoodle would have featured very heavily had I chosen to stay at home. We succumbed to the pandemic puppy. Um, that is a three-legged box of pit mix and a blind, well, partially blind deaf Labradoodle. So our home is a very interesting place to be. Um, but I am absolutely delighted to be here today. As I said, it's felt like an age since I've sort of been able to share some of the science with COVID. And so I'm really excited to be able to share this with you. Um, so as Alan said, I'm going to talk a little bit today about meteorites as objects of cultural importance. And I'm really going to focus on the culture side of things as opposed to sort of the in-depth meteoritic side, because I feel like that's probably a departure from the talks that you normally have. And it's really interesting to see these meteorites from a different perspective and a different point of view. So we know that meteorites have been used as a source of iron in many cultures. And sometimes as a result, they were used to create items that had particular importance. So we have knives that are the earliest examples of ironwork in China. They date back to around 1000 BCE. Um, they're believed to have belonged to a maquis at the time. Um, we have meteoritic iron that's been found in the Hopewell Mounds, which are earthwork structures that are about 2,000 years old that have been built by the Native American people in Ohio. Some of you may have heard Tim McCoy talk about these beads. So he studied two beads from one of the mounds in Illinois and actually discovered that they were pieces of the Anoka iron meteorite. And that's significant because the Anoka iron actually fell in Minnesota. So we have these beads found in this, what's called the Illinois mound. So how did they get there from Minnesota? So it's likely that what happened is this material has been traded. It was seen to have value and significance and was traded through various native tribes until it ended up in central Illinois. We have fog chags, which you may or may not have heard of, that translates actually as thunder iron. And those are a type of Tibetan talisman. And they are often made of meteoritic metal. You can get those dating back as far as the Bronze Age. And traditionally, they were thought to protect the wearer from evil, but also attract both energy and success for the people that wore them. In particular, we have quite a few examples of objects from Egypt. 
it's well documented over a large range of time in ancient Egypt. So from the pre-dynastic period right through to the New Kingdom, the oldest of these artifacts are these beads that were found in the Gerza Cemetery in Egypt. They date back to about 3300 BCE. They actually represent the earliest observed use of iron in this area. And they were buried with their owner. So again, illustrating that they were considered precious. Then there are some sort of more high profile artifacts that have been found in the tombs of pharaohs, so or the wives. Um, there was what is known as a Peshesh Kef amulet made out of a meteorite found in the tomb of one of the wives of King Men Tuotep. I always, I always wonder how to say these things. And um, these were very, very symbolic because when you mummify a body, you can no longer open the mouth. So it was believed that there was an afterlife. That was something they felt very strongly about. So this implement, this amulet was believed to be able to restore the ability for that person to use their mouth. So the one shown here is not made out of meteorite. I haven't been able to find an image of this particular artifact but it does show the overall shape of the object. Uh, this one's actually made of uh, a horn blend granite. So the most high profile is probably the dagger that was found in Tutankhamun's tomb. But in actual fact, they also found a bracelet, a headrest, and then another sort of set of iron bladed miniature tools. When we have examined these, when other authors have examined these, they see that the dagger, the bracelet, and the headrest are all made of different meteorites. And this demonstrates that you know, all these objects that have been manufactured in Egyptian antiquity, um, it's difficult to identify their source material because they're not all from one specimen. And to identify possible meteorites among the unworked specimens we have in modern collections is really a complicated process. All of these objects that I've described appear to have some emblematic function, again, suggesting that this meteoritic material was highly valued. So what about more modern times? And considerably less work has been done on more recent ethnographic objects of meteoritic origin from Egypt and in fact, around the world. And in terms of Egypt, this lightly results because as early as the seventh century BCE, smelted iron was being introduced via trade into Egypt. And from about the middle of the first century BCE, um, the Egyptians were smelting iron ore um, to produce carbon bearing cast iron. So once you start using cast iron, any metallic objects that are produced are really unlikely to be identified as meteoritic unless there was some kind of oral history with them, identifying them as something special, or they were measured and found to have a really sort of high nickel concentration. But one of these more recent objects from Egypt is the camel charm, which is shown on an image on this slide. And the camel charm is in the collection um, at the Smithsonian, the National Museum of National History. So the National Meteorite Collection. And it was acquired from the Geological Museum in Cairo in 1974. And it was accessioned into the collection along with some other Egyptian meteorites about three years later. And it was suggested to be a meteorite, but there was no origin given for the camel charm. And no quantitative analyses before this study had been performed on this sample. And my interest in the camel charm actually extends back to when I was a postdoc at the Smithsonian. And I started there in 2008, I was there for a year. And I was attending a tour that Tim McCoy was giving at the time. And when we were putting all the meteorites away after the tour, I opened up a drawer and I said, what's this? 
And Tim said to me, oh, well, that's the camel charm. And we don't even know if that's a meteorite. And I'm a curious soul. And I said, can I see if it's a meteorite? And Tim said, sure, you can't damage it. You can't touch it in any way. But if you can figure out a way to see if that's a meteorite, then sure, go ahead. And so my interest was definitely peaked. And I decided to undertake a study on this, which has taken quite some time, but just because we've tried to be sensitive in how we do these analyses, but also keeping the charm as intact as possible. So when I came across the charm, it had a handwritten note with it. And this is the text from that handwritten note. It says, a camel's charm bought from the Egyptian nomad Bedouin Abdullah Karabawi of the Ababda tribe, Eastern Desert of Egypt. He reported that his grandfather procured a fallen star, meteorite, somewhere in the Eastern Desert. And a local blacksmith made this and other charms and daggers out of it. Before the advent of motor cars in the Egyptian desert and during the early 30s, Camels were the most important carriers. Charms of different kind were hung to them to keep them healthy and helpful and to keep the bad eyes away from them. This meteorite charm was highly estimated by him, Abdullah Karabawi. So that is pretty much all the information that I had. Uh, and this note was written by Dr. Al Far, who was at the time the director of the Egyptian Geological Museum in Cairo. Um, where the sample came from. When we think about charms and amulets and their history, amulets are actually said to be the oldest form of jewelry. They are often, they're not just decorative, they're believed to have some kind of ability to either protect from evil eye, like the card suggests for the camel charm, or even bestow power such as luck on the wearer. Um, on the right here, you see um, an amulet of the Ankh symbol, and this actually represents a sandal strap. And this was the hieroglyph for life in ancient Egypt. And it's one of the most common amulets we find in Egypt because of their belief and desire for eternal life after death. But it's not just humans that wear charms. We also put them on livestock, like camels. And this tradition actually goes back centuries. Sometimes they're as simple as you hang a brightly colored bead um, around the neck or around the ear of the animal. And the idea is that it's brightly colored and that the evil eye will be distracted by the bead and diverted from the valuable animal, which will save it. So there's actually a long-standing record of charms around the necks of camels in particular. So believe it or not, it's mentioned in the Bible. So here is a quote where it says, you know, Gideon proceeded to kill and he took the crescents that were on the necks of their camels. So this is from Judges chapter eight. So here we're mentioning something around the neck of a camel. And then in the writing of Islamic scholars, and this one is sort of more significant. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't advance that slide, but there's that quote from Judges that I said. But then there's a longer one from Islamic scholars um, this one is from a book called The Feats and the Knowers of God, and it's by um, a religious scholar in the 14th century. And it says here, he saw that the camel had an amulet tied to its neck. When he removed the amulet, the predatory beasts immediately attacked and tore the camel to pieces. Now know and be aware that the world is like that camel, and the religious scholar commanders men of poverty and others who are in the world are like that caravan of pilgrims. And my existence is like that amulet that has been tied to the neck of the camel of the world. As long as that amulet is on its neck, the amulet is effective. 
and the caravan of the world travels on as it pleases. When the amulet is removed, then behold what will happen to the world and where mankind will go and in what way sultans and bearers of the banner will perish. So here we see, you know, a direct mention of something around a camel's neck in the 14th century that is seen to protect it and used as an analogy of how um, belief and the existence of God is a protection. So when it comes to this study, what we wanted to do was to confirm first that the camel charm is of meteoritic origin. And since I am giving this talk about it, spoiler alert, you've probably guessed that it was, or this would be a bit of a letdown at the end here. Then we wanted to establish if we can tell which iron meteorite the camel charm came from. Is it one that has already been described and is in current collections, or is it a new meteorite to science? We wanted to see if we could establish how it was manufactured and then to investigate and expand upon the note and the claims that were made in that note by Dr. Alfar. And when I say um, investigate those, I mean things like, um, do the Ababda people value camels? Is it likely that they hung a charm around the neck of these um, these animals? What is the possible cultural significance of the camel charm? So I'm going to talk both about the cultural and scientific investigations that we did, but really with a focus on kind of the background of this charm and what we thought. Um, I'm getting notifications, but I can't see the chat. So if there are any questions, please just speak up as I go through. How big is this? Oh, so I just advanced it. So there you see. Um, it is about six and a half centimeters in diameter, and it's a flattened and it's nearly circular disc of metal, and it's about five millimeters in thickness. And there are four interlocking chain links. Now, in the images on the right, you only see three for reasons that will become apparent as I talk. Um, the first three links, the links that are most, uh, that are closest to the charm are all kind of rectangular with rounded edges, as you can see. The fourth link, which is shown here in a separate image is actually rounded. So it has a circular shape, but it's been flattened. Um, so it's not round all the way. It weighs just under a hundred grams and there is an inscription on both sides of it. And I've put rubbings here. It's almost like little brass rubbings to highlight those. Um, and the inscription, it's Alo Akbar. The, um, where the proximal link goes through the charm, that hole is about five millimeters um, in diameter. And then in addition to the Arabic script, you can see this pattern of radial lines that come out sort of the outer third of the charm and that resembles a sunburst pattern which is not uncommon for this um, region it's a relatively common motif so when we first went to look at the charm um, Tim is the curator of this collection, and he said that anything I did had to be non-destructive. And so the very first task was just, is this a meteorite? And so you can see it here. This is actually right before it went in the SEM at the Smithsonian, where we did some EDS analysis and just some really basic surface mapping to see if this was a meteorite. And immediately, our first measurement told us that this had nickel in it. It was around 7%. Um, and the map, which I'm going to show you on the next slide, this is a little rough. Um, and I ask you to forgive me that there's no scale, but this was something where we, I literally went from the room where I was told I could investigate this and kind of popped in the SEM. It wasn't in use. 
we just did something really quickly and I didn't really record back then this initial part. But what this is showing you is iron nickel maps combined for the charm. And so the areas rich in nickel are blue and the background area is predominantly iron. So we can immediately see here that we have camasite and tainite, right? So the tainite is in the bluer areas, the much more nickel rich alloy. So immediately we know that we have a meteorite, but you can also see from this image that it's really rough. And this is because the surface of the charm is very rough. And there was no possibility of cleaning the charm, removing a piece of the charm. And so I was pretty much told at this point, okay, that's great. We know it's a meteorite now, but there's nothing else that you can do. And um, around this time, I actually took the job at uh, TCU. And so I started my tenure track position and I didn't really think about this for a couple of months. And then I called Tim with sort of a genius idea. And I said to him, what if the links are also made of meteorite? What if those four chain links are made of meteorite? Would you let me take a sliver, and if I back up here, a sliver out of where those links join to continue studying this. And that is why the fourth link is not attached in this image because the answer to that was yes. So where you see that round link, you can see where it joins. And we took a tiny little slither from that join in order to study this. So this is a backscatter image of the section that we removed from that distal link. We made a thick section with it, and that was the only material I knew I had to work with for the rest of the study. So what we see here is um, a section that again contains both camasite and tainite. The brighter areas are the tainite. Um, we have tainite ribbons that are only about 150 microns in width, and you can see that they are distorted. So they're broken and curved in some areas, particularly to the left edge of the sample here. And then on the right, um, towards the bottom of the section, there's um, an area of comb plesite. We didn't see any phosphorus or um, sulfur bearing phases at all in this section. It appears to just be camasite and tainite. We did some electron microprobe of this sample and came up with, uh, through a zoning profile, an average composition of about 7.8 weight percent nickel. So again, we definitely have a meteorite and we also have now a nickel content. Um, and from there, we wanted to move this study on uh, to try and establish how it was made and if we could find out what meteorite it was made from. So as I'm sure you can imagine, as a meteoriticist, forging is not my specialty. Um, I'm not a blacksmith by trade. However, my husband is, um, he went through a phase of watching binge watching, thanks to Netflix, um, some forging shows on the television, which meant I got exposed to a lot of different blacksmith techniques in our evenings together. I would work on lectures and he would watch these shows. And so I picked some stuff up and obviously did some research on this. But initially just looking at this, we have preservation of metallographic structure. And immediately that tells us, well, this isn't made from casting iron. We've preserved the structure. So we haven't cast the charm or the links. And the preservation of having tainite and camasite also indicates that we're not looking at temperatures that are in excess of about 750 degrees centigrade. So it never reached that temperature or it never achieved thermal equilibrium at that temperature. And we know that because in the iron nickel phase diagram, any temperatures above that lie within the one phase field. So we wouldn't see the metallographic structure anymore. It would have been destroyed. 
Um, what's interesting is that this holds true for many of the archaeological meteoritic artifacts that we find because they were made through these cycles of heating in wood fueled fires. And when you do that, you get the metal up to about 600 degrees C. And you also do some cold working in those situations. But the Ababda had access to charcoal. And so they had the ingredients to produce temperatures that would have significantly modified the metallographic structure during the manufacture of the camel charm. What we're seeing looking at this is that that's probably not the technique they used because we still have this preservation of the structure. Um, in addition, we can learn about how this formed by looking at the surface. So just here are two close up images of some of the engraving and the surface of the charm. So that first image in the center shows some of the sunburst pattern and you can also see that there are abrasions across the surface of the charm that are in multiple directions. They change directions across the charm. So this tells us that there was a grinding process that went on on the surface. You see these on both sides. And we believe that was something probably like a grindstone that would be a relatively traditional method for grinding this down. If we stay looking at these two images, we can actually also learn how the patterns were applied. So the starburst, when we look at each of the starburst patterns, they are slightly different shapes and slightly different sizes, which indicates they probably use different chisels, but it looks like it was a single tool mark. So they held the chisel and they hammered it until they had made the mark and then they moved on. We don't see an example of multiple um, depressions for each starburst. Whereas if you look at the image on the right, which is part of the Arabic script, you can see that there are small stepped chisel marks, which indicates that this was made in a completely different way. Here they incrementally hammered with a chisel in order to get the shape they wanted in the script. So these two marks were produced in different ways. Now, we can't tell whether this was hot worked or cold worked. So these chisel marks could have been applied when the metal is heated or when it's not. We can't discern that. In addition, when we look at the chain links, the ends of the chain links are not forge welded. And forge welding is when you join each link so it is a continuous loop of metal. You don't see the join anymore. Whereas if you look at the links here, you can see they've been hammered together so that they are close or touching on each of the links. And in fact, that means because they've been hammered close together, often they're slightly a distorted shape close to where they're joining. Um, on the right hand side, what you're looking at here is the hole that has been used to join the links. And this hole used a technique known as drifting. And what drifting is, is that you first punch a hole through the sample, likely while it is hot. It'd be very, very difficult to do this while it was cold. And then you insert a tapered rod with the small end in the hole, and you drive the tapered rod through the sample until you have the hole the size that you want. When you do that, you push the metal to the other side of the sample. So you get a raised lip around the hole on the other side. And so that would be rough. And so what typically is done is you take that same tapered rod and you put it in the other side and you drive that lip back inwards. And if you look at the sample here, I need to move you all so I can put my point here. In here, there is a lip. Um, that we can see. So we know that that's how this hole was made. It was drifted in. Um, again, this is a relatively primitive technique. We do still use it today. Um, but overall, when we look at the charm, 
modest heating and some cold working is suggested, but it's really hard to distinguish between all these processes. So this style of metal working dates back almost 7,000 years. So, oh, there we go. So what is the source material? That's the next step. Um, the linkage between the camel charm and the Ababda immediately gives us a location, which is Eastern Europe. And therefore we have to look about, was this meteorite source locally or within the range of Bedouin trade routes? Because as we learned from samples from the US, Native Americans traded these samples and they could actually travel large distances. So what we did was we took the nickel content that we had and we looked at what were the known iron meteorites from Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Libya. Um, there weren't any in Israel or Jordan, but we looked at all the iron meteorites that have been found um, and either within Egypt or the countries that were surrounding it. Um, honestly, we only ended up with one that was um, similar Meso, you know, um, major, minor trace elements. And that was Weber. Um, I will say that Aswan, which is a 1AB iron, um, was actually the iron meteorite found closest to the Ababda homelands. So it fell or was discovered relatively close to where the Ababda are known to live. However, it does not have a matching composition. So we decided that we would perform LAICPMS both of the camel charm and Weber. And the reason that we used this method is I just had the thick section. So INAA was not a possibility. And while Weber has been measured previously, we wanted to compare apples to apples. So both of these um, were sent off for LAICPMS, and those analyses were done by James Day at Scripps. So then we have analyses of both of these. We do we did traverses across each sample to try and get a good idea of bulk that was comparable between the two samples. And here are the results of that. So both Weber and the Camel Charm for the low nickel, high iridium end of the group three ABs. And on this sample, the black dot is camel charm and the gray is way bar. So in the top, you can see they plot kind of over each other. And then in the bottom, you can see that camel charm is slightly higher in iridium. Um, when you look at the diagram on the right, which is directly comparing um, the composition of camel charm and way bar, you can see there are differences in the concentrations of the highly siderophile elements. And this was a point of contention between my co-authors and I for quite some time. We oscillated on whether these variations could occur within an individual sample like Weber or whether they signified that these were different meteorites. Um, in fact, at LPSC two, three years ago, we were kind of leaning towards it was Weber, but by the time we published this paper, we had decided we didn't think it was. And I will say that the nomenclature committee agreed with us. So there are examples of different masses of the same meteorite having variability. Um, however, that variability seems to depend on the total known weight of those iron meteorites. And Weber is 2.5 tons around there. And so the variability that we see is much higher than would be expected from previous studies that have looked at how individual masses vary. Um, so eventually we decided, okay, we're looking at two different meteorites here. I will draw your attention to the difference in gallium concentration, because I'm sure if I don't, someone's gonna bring that up. That's enigmatic. We do not know why gallium is different, where germanium is relatively similar. These are volatile siderophile elements. And so they are the ones that we would expect to be most affected by blacksmithing processes if they are affected at all. However, when we look at other artifacts produced um, in similar ways at about the same temperatures, they don't see, they don't show any differences in these concentrations. So that remains an unsolved mystery at this point. Okay. 
So let's move on to Ryan, the, and I'm sorry, I had a quick, very quick question for you on the previous sure. slide. By the way, it's great to see you. <laughs> hey, Mandy. On the previous slide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I can understand. I mean, we can kind of wave our hands and understand why the gallium might be depleted. But how is it that all of the lower elements, the rhenium, osmium, and tungsten, those were all enriched? I mean, doesn't that? Yeah, so it, that's fine within the range of the three ABs, which this is but we couldn't explain that if it was a piece of waiver. That's what I'm saying. So initially we debated this because we do have plesite in the sample and we know that some of these elements are fractionated differently when you're dealing with things like plesite in a sample. Mm -hmm. But when we looked at the location of the traverses um, in both samples, we just felt like this was a difference that couldn't be explained. Um, but it was probably the thing in the paper that took us the longest to really be sure of. Um, so we submitted this as a new meteorite. Okay, thank you. Okay, no problem. Um, but of course, we can have the um, meteoritics to back us up, but does the cultural study also back up that this is probably not Weber? Do we have more evidence to support that? So the Ababda are a very ancient culture. Um, they've been living in the same geographical location um, since Roman times, it's suggested. Some people say that they've even been mentioned by classical writers such as Pliny, um, but really it's just that Bedouin have been living in that area since those times. They are indigenous to Africa and they earn their living, they used to, predominantly through herding animals and trading products, such as medicinal herbs and charcoal. However, like many native cultures, a lot of their traditions are dying out. And in fact, this has been recognized particularly for the Ababda and there is now a heritage center dedicated to them called Beit Ababda, which means the house of the Ababda. And it's located in Wadi El Gamal, which is the Valley of the Camel. And this is the name of a 7,000 square kilometer national park in Egypt, uh, which can be found right on the edge of the Red Sea. If you go to Beit Ababda, uh, the very first exhibit actually talks about what the Ababda hold most dear. So it's research into what are the most important items to their culture. And um, turns out that they hold dear to their heart the very same things that I do, coffee. Um, they have a traditional coffee set. Uh, which both men and women said was their most prized possession. They actually have a coffee ceremony, which involves something they call jabana, which is a very strong coffee. And it is a ritual in their culture. It's how they show hospitality. It's how they encourage communication with visitors, both from people outside of the tribe and people that are inside of the tribe that are visiting perhaps a family. Um, if you think of it almost akin to Japanese tea ceremonies, this is something that's very, very important to them. So important that that coffee set is their most prized possession. But when they continue to ask, okay, after that, what do you value? Nearly all the men said that their camels were their second most important possession, along with everything relating to the camels. And men are traditionally the sole caretakers of the camels in the Ababda tribe. And they provide not only transportation, but also a means to carry their belongings and for all the goods that they're trading over long distances. So they would be viewed as very valuable assets, clearly. And again, we protect our valuable assets from the evil eye. Um, belief in the evil eye has been prevalent in the life of the Bedouin kind of for as long as we have done research or recorded the life of Bedouin. When you look at anthropo um, anthropological studies um, in the Negev region of the Middle East, these are from 2005, those beliefs were still very prevalent. Now, I could find no research that had asked the Ababda, but it is not unreasonable to assert that this is something that they too believe. Uh, the charm, the Aluhakbar, 
God is greatest fits with that suggested usage. You want to ward away the evil. This is a sacred object. Um, when we look at where the Ababda are from, I have the map of Egypt on the left and then on the right, that sort of orange red region that is outlined, the desert area of the Red Sea Mountains um, of Egypt, that is the range where we find them. So this is where the Wadi Al Gamal National Park is. And if we move from that area to, we kind of zoom out, thank you, Google Maps, and we look at where the Waybar Crater is, they are approximately one and a half thousand miles away from one another. And the caravan routes of the Ababda are really recorded quite well, and they traditionally are from the Nile to the banks of the Red Sea. There isn't much um, in terms of them trading with Israel, Jordan, or Saudi Arabia. So this was kind of the final nail in the coffin. We can't really, meter, using the compositional data, say that we find the link, nor can we explain how that material could have been traded through to the Ababda from where it fell if this was a piece of Weber. Um, and again, the oral history suggests that it was found by them, right? He found, he procured a fallen star. Um, so in conclusion, what we've said about the sample is that given the compositional differences, uh, coupled with the distance and lack of established trade routes, it's unlikely that Weber is the source material for camel charm. There, Camel charm is a 3AB iron. That is the most common type of iron that we have here on earth. So it likely just derived from a sample that is unknown from the unworked specimens that we have in meteorite collections. Um, we submitted, and it is an official name, this meteorite is called Wadi El Gamal. And we chose that because while the initial location of this meteorite is unknown, we wanted to acknowledge the importance of this meteorite to the Ababda people and the history of the object itself. And that name was accepted by the nomenclature committee. And with that, at ooh, almost exactly 45 minutes, um, I want to thank you, but also my um, collaborators on this project, my co-authors, Tim McCoy, Carrie Cargan, and Tim Rose, all of whom are at the Smithsonian and came down this rabbit hole with me, despite the fact that it was a big diversion from what they normally do. And also James Day at Scripps, who did all the LAICPMS work for us. And with that, I would love to take some questions. So very, very impressive uh, study. I'm wondering um, what non-metal uh, meteorites have been found to have been used culturally as tools and, and whatnot. You know, the vast majority seem to be metallic. And I'll be honest, I haven't done much research into the stone ones. Um, but now you've, uh, I'll furiously write that down after this talk. And uh, I'll maybe go off and research that. I have found this just to be fascinating um, to learn a little bit more about the history of these objects. Um, the Tibetan talismans, it wouldn't surprise me if that kind of material had been used. Uh, those thog chags. Um, and they're very highly prized and really quite well studied. I, I spent many years as an archaeologist, and I remember in Tucson, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, one of the uh, French uh, meteorite dealers had a, a mortar uh, made out of perhaps a chondrite. I don't know what kind of a meteorite it was. Anybody else remember that? He no longer uh -huh. goes to Tucson. I, I, that, are you speaking about Alain Carillon? No, no, I'm not talking about Carillon. It's a, a person who had uh, <clears throat> sort of a falling out with the meteorite community over uh, terrorists. Well, anyway, that, uh, that, that, that seems a little leaders. bit off topic, Nick. Um, yeah, okay. And we have a question uh, from Tom Burbine, who actually has two quick questions. He said, what is the estimated age of the camel charm? That's question one. So we don't know. We don't know. So that would have required um, a more destructive analysis. And I was given permission to do exactly what I did and no more. The 
uh, the charm itself had to remain as intact as possible. So there was just that one slither. So we don't know. We assumed that it was more recent um, just because of the oral history that came with it, which implied that Dr. Alfar had knowledge of this. Um, and it was a grandfather that was mentioned. So we assumed it not to be too old, but I do not know the exact age. I wish I did. Tom also asks, would you expect an object made from an iron meteorite to be stronger or weaker than the same type of object made from terrestrial iron? I think that's going to depend on how it has been forged, right? So in forging, and again, I am speaking from having watched entirely too many hours of Forged in Fire on Amazon. Um, in forging, a lot of the strength depends on how often you are heating and cooling your sample and how you are heating and cooling it. So I would anticipate it could be both weaker and stronger, depending on that. In fact, they even had an episode on that show where they gave the meteorite to forge from. So have, it's just uh, going to depend on the techniques used. I have a couple of comments. Uh, first is that I post Dr. the Smithsonian in 82 to 83, and nobody showed me that charm. So I'm kind of jealous uh, <laughs> got to see it, and I did not. Um, but also, uh, shortly after I got to UCLA in the early 80s, someone came in with a xylophone made out of meteoritic iron. Uh, they called it a bell's instruments, and they had these different planks, like in a xylophone, forged from different iron meteorites that were sort of melted together. So that was sort of interesting. Uh, I think I'm going to Juliet, who can read you some of the questions in uh, the uh, chat box. And I say that we, we got up to 77 participants, Rhiannon. So you- Wow. Uh, I'll put so that on. And, uh, ask her some of the additional questions, please. Sure. Uh, one of the next questions is, oh, sorry, people are still chatting, so it's moving up. Um, is it known if the composition of the camel charm matches any of the other Egyptian meteoritic tools of charms, i.e. ones found in Tutankhamun's tomb? Not that we could find, no, but those have not been analyzed as thoroughly, right? So a lot of the other artifacts we're looking at, they've just had XRF done, where you know that they are made of a meteorite and you know that they're different because of the nickel content, but all of the, um, our ability with LAICPMS, it's far superior to the other stuff that has been measured. Um, the Gerzebeads had a little bit more work done, but it was not the same as those. We think this is another unique one. Great. And another question is, is a specific question, but are there any tea sets made of meteorites, if anyone on the call happens to know that? Not that I'm aware of. I wouldn't think it was a great material for a tea set. Um, although being British, you're speaking my language. I'm a huge fan of tea, but even I don't think I want something made of meteorites so heavy. Um, but not that I'm aware of, unless someone else knows. Uh, another question, um, which might be difficult for an answer, but is, will the camel charm be repatriated? So I can't speak for the Smithsonian, right? So this is something that is not, um, that is not in my purview. Um, I do not believe there are any plans right now. Um, it was traded. Um, so there was an exchange with, the director of the Geological Museum in Cairo. Um, so it did belong to them and the Geologic Museum did a deal with the Smithsonian. So that is that is the Smithsonian's job. So yeah, I can't answer that one, I'm afraid. Um, how much wear was there on the chain links? There was quite a lot of wear, they were smooth. Um, it, was hard to get any really good details because we didn't clean it at all, right? So everything's covered in a thick layer of grime, which makes images kind of hard to take, which is why these images aren't great. You can only do so, so well with an object that's so dirty. Um, but everything was really quite smooth. There were no real sharp edges. And even though the 
grind marks on the surface of the charm were quite rough. There was nothing that I would say protruded or was sharp anywhere on the charm. Uh, did you do etched light microscopy? Uh, we did not, no. And um, this is from Paul. Is there any trace of a prior inscription, Islam being relatively recent by Egyptian standards? No, there was no trace of anything else. But again, all we have is really looking at detail on the surface and photographs because of how dirty the charm was. But no, I mean, I'm sure it's possible um, that the sunburst pattern and the script could have been done at different times. They both use different methods. So I can't say that everything um, that was inscribed on the charm was contemporaneous because we haven't date, we can't date any of it. So it's possible. Hmm. And another Do you question. think it likely oh. that the uh, meteorite was just something that was found in the 30s or thereabouts just picked up locally because it stood out so much on the light colored uh, ground surface and just was forged locally and the thing probably just weighed a few hundred grams or something? Yeah, I mean, when you think about that oral history that came with it, or rather the note that came with it, that seems to fit, right? So he wrote almost as if he knew the person. He gave a name, Abdullah Karabawi, which is why we've called it Karabawi's Charm. Um, and he says that that person's grandfather, but it just says procured it and that a local blacksmith made it. But to us, we always read that as it really wasn't so old which is sort of why it surprised us that um, it hadn't perhaps reached higher temperatures during forging um, and that we hadn't lost the metal graphic structure within it. But yeah, I would agree with you, Alan. I don't think it's that old, but again, we don't have the date. So that's just my assumption. Sure, we have a few more questions. Uh, one is uh, from Don Hurd. He wonders if there's, if any of the present day about uh, would have heirlooms of similar material, which they still use in charms on their canvas. I'm sure they could. Um, finding papers for this and researching the Ababda was probably the most challenging part. Um, I was traveling to art museums that had special journals and um, there was nothing described in the Beit Ababda, so that heritage center, that led me to believe that there were any other charms or any other meteorite objects that the Ababda have. But I can tell you if I ever get an opportunity to visit that region, um, that I will, because I became really interested in that. And I can see that I think uh, Gary had his hand up too. Go ahead, Gary. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Sure. Yeah, perfect. Okay, yeah. Um, you know, I don't want to dominate it, but several questions, Rihanna, that um, can you, you know, I put this into the chat, but maybe you can do it for here. Can you identify the uh, the cartouche on the off by any chance, who, who it belongs to? No. Yeah, because it, it did look, yeah, it, it doesn't resemble any particular pharaoh or, because no. it, the hieroglyphics are pretty clear from what I could see. Uh, no, I don't. I don't know that. No. Yeah. Oh, okay. you mean? Do you mean the um, the? There's a cartouche on it. The, oh, in the Peshev Kef that I showed you, is that what yeah, you're the, talking the, about? A, yeah. I believe it's a lapis. It looks like a lapis cart. Uh, oh. Um, it's hornblende granite. I took that. Oh, okay. Did sure. I? It's it's lost the link, but no, I, they may well know where that one is. I can. I tried to put all my image references on here, mm -hmm. uh, but that is from an art museum. So there may be that information. Oh, okay, okay. You know, the other thing I would consider is that on the, the marks on the, on the amulet or the, on the, the thing itself, I wondered if those, the stun burst was done with a die as opposed to a chisel, because it- if It you could have been, but- yeah. Go ahead. I only zoomed in on some of it. They were mm -hmm. different shapes and different sizes. So mm -hmm. it could have been, um, because if you look like the end on some ends appeared rounded and wider than the rest. Right, um, right. So that's possible, but a variety were used because they were dissimilar throughout. And it seemed, when you look, it's, it does seem like they fit it around the inscription almost. Mm. 
Yeah. Um, so sometimes the mark had to be a lot smaller just so that they could fit it in around it. Yeah, yeah, because when on different, I would imagine with given the, the constituent metals, if it's nickel and iron mixed together with whatever, that the modulus of that metal would change such that you could, given a temperature that it's in the fire and all these things, you could almost kind of predict what, what tool was used, if, if you follow my, my thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it goes with that. Uh, one more question real quick. If Waybar is not the, the, the candidate for the source material, what, it, what is? Is there other falls there in that particular region or, or what do you think? No, it is, we believe it's a meteorite that is not known from mm -hmm. other collections, from modern collections. So it's yeah. not an unworked specimen. Does that mean that it won't be? No, it's possible that, you know, we'll add it later on. It could be in a private collection and we're just not, it's not in uh, the meteorite database, but it doesn't match anything that we found. When you compare it to other 380s that are local, the iridium content is just too different for it to be the same meteorite. The, the, it, the metal doesn't show question. Yeah, yeah uh, sorry, go ahead. One, one from Nick and one from Mendy, and then that'll have to be it. Go ahead, Nick. Um, yeah, have you thought about doing micro CT scans of that artifact? It's uh, not expensive and not destructive it might be uh, worth considering. You know, that's a great idea. I hadn't considered that. And I do quite a bit of CT work on palisites and eucrites. And so I actually literally just picked a Martian meteorite from UT Austin just a couple of weeks ago that I had CT done on. So that's a possibility. I will say that um, while we were writing this up, we would have liked to do a few more things on this sample, but it was actually on display in a museum in France. It was on loan. So I couldn't do anything extra to it um, because that loan extended through when we wanted to publish. But that is a great idea and uh, definitely something for the future. Thank you. Before I have Mendy ask his question, can you tell us the reference, the citation for your paper? Um, it is in Meteoritics and Planetary Science last year. I think COVID time works very differently for me. <laughs> but it will be main at Allen. It's in Meteoritics and Planetary Science. OK, we'll be able to find it. OK, go ahead, Mendy. Yeah, I think um, you know when you take a look at those trade routes, um, it's not just the Ababda people that were going on their trade routes. Um, just like everything else, it's quite likely that it probably changed, the, that the material changed hands many different times before it got to them. So, you know, I, I, I don't know that it makes any sense to do so, but, you know, looking at the peoples around the Wabar area to see, you know, what their trade routes were, and, and who they might have interacted along the way, you know, could give a clue potentially, even though you're saying that it's not Wabar. I don't know if that's completely off the table, but anyways, I'm just saying. It's, com it's so, I mean, it's a possibility when you think about how far the Anoka iron had to travel to end up right, in right. central Illinois, right? So it's a possibility. It was just unlikely. And when you combine that with the compositional information, we really couldn't make a great argument for this. Um, and I think initially, because Tim came from looking at the Hopewell beads, Tim was very much team, this is a piece of Weber, right? Um, and I was always a little bit, I'm not that convinced. <laughs> um, and at times he convinced me and at times I convinced him. But in the end, when we came to write this up, we really felt strongly, we just couldn't make a convincing enough case and when we submitted this to the nomenclature committee, they agreed that they felt the most comfortable with this being given a new name. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I think we have to wrap it up. Let's all thank Rhiannon for a fascinating talk on a subject we don't usually get. So thanks very much. Uh, we really appreciate thank it. You. Hope to see you.